Women in Islam vs. Women in the Judeo-Christian Tradition, The Myth and the Reality Part 2 Part 4 Female Education The difference between the biblical and the Quranic conceptions of women is not limited to the newly born female, it extends far beyond that. Let us compare their attitudes towards a female trying to learn her religion. The heart of Judaism is the Torah, the law. However, according to the Talmud, women are exempt from the study of the Torah. Some Jewish rabbis firmly declared, let the words of Torah rather be destroyed by fire than imparted to women. And, whoever teaches his daughter Torah is as though he taught her obscenity. Denise L. Carmody, Judaism, in Arvind Sharma, edition, op. Sit, page 197. The attitude of St. Paul Indiana the New Testament is not brighter as in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34-35 How can a woman learn if she is not allowed to speak? How can a woman grow intellectually if she is obliged to be in a state of full submission? How can she broaden her horizons if her one and only source of information is her husband at home? Now, to be fair, we should ask, is the Quranic position any different? One short story narrated in the Quran sums its position up concisely. Kala was a Muslim woman whose husband AWS pronounced this statement at a moment of anger, You are to me as the back of my mother. This was held by pagan Arabs to be a statement of divorce which freed the husband from any conjugal responsibility but did not leave the wife free to leave the husband's home or to marry another. Man. Having heard these words from her husband, Kala was in a miserable situation. She went straight to the Prophet of Islam to plead her case. The Prophet was of the opinion that she should be patient since there seemed to be no way out. Kala kept arguing with the Prophet in an attempt to save her suspended marriage. Shortly, the Quran intervened, Kala's plea was accepted. The divine verdict abolished this iniquitous custom. One full chapter, chapter 58, of the Quran whose title is, al Majadila, or, The Woman Who Pleads, was named after this incident. Allah has heard and accepted the statement of the woman who pleads with you, the Prophet, concerning her husband and carries her complaint to Allah. And Allah hears the arguments between both of you for Allah hears and sees all things. Quran 58,1 O Messenger! Verily Allah has heard the words of the woman, she was Kala bint the Laba, who was discussing the issue of her husband with you, who was AWS ibn Almit, after he had done zihar to her. She was complaining to Allah about what her husband had done to her, and Allah was listening to your exchange of words. Nothing is hidden from him, indeed, he is the hearing of the speech of his servants and the seeing of their actions, none of them are hidden from him. al Mujadilla 1 A woman in the Quranic conception has the right to argue even with the Prophet of Islam himself. No one has the right to instruct her to be silent. She is under no obligation to consider her husband the one and only reference in matters of law and religion. Part 5 Unclean Impure Women Jewish laws and regulations concerning menstruating women are extremely restrictive. The Old Testament considers any menstruating woman as unclean and impure. Moreover, her impurity infects others as well. Anyone or anything she touches becomes unclean for a day. When a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches her bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Whoever touches anything she sits on must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Whether it is the bed or anything she was sitting on, when anyone touches it, he will be unclean till evening, Lev. 15,19-23 Due to her, contaminating, nature, a menstruating woman was sometimes, banished, in order to avoid any possibility of any contact with her. She was sent to a special house called, the House of Uncleanness, for the whole period of her impurity, Swidler, Op. 
Sit, page 137. The Talmud considers a menstruating woman fatal even without any physical contact. Our rabbis taught if a menstruant woman passes between two men, if it is at the beginning of her menses she will slay one of them. And if it is at the end of her menses she will cause strife between them, BPES. 111a. Furthermore, the husband of a menstruous woman was forbidden to enter the synagogue if he had been made unclean by her even by the dust under her feet. A priest whose wife, daughter, or mother was menstruating could not recite priestly blessing in the synagogue, Ibid. Page 138, No wonder many Jewish women still refer to menstruation as, the curse. Sally Prezand, Judaism and the New Woman, New York, Behrman House, Inc., 1975, page 24. Islam does not consider a menstruating woman to possess any kind of contagious uncleanness. She is neither untouchable nor cursed. She practices her normal life with only one restriction, a married couple are not allowed to have sexual intercourse during the period of menstruation. Any other physical contact between them is permissible. A menstruating woman is exempted from some rituals such as daily prayers and fasting during her period. Part 6, Bearing Witness Another issue in which the Quran and the Bible disagree is the issue of women bearing witness. It is true that the Quran has instructed the believers dealing in financial transactions to get two male witnesses or one male and two females, Quran 2 282. O you who have faith in Allah and follow his messenger, when you enter a transaction that involves a debt, such as when you give a loan to one another for a fixed period, then write it down. The person who is able to write should write it down fairly and in accordance with the sacred law. And should not refuse to write down the debt in accordance with what Allah has taught him about writing justly. He should write what is dictated by the person against whom the right is so that it serves as an acknowledgement from him. He should be mindful of Allah and not reduce anything from the value or description of the debt. If the debtor is not experienced in undertaking transactions, young, insane or is not able to dictate due to being mute or for some other reason, then his authoritative guardian should dictate with fairness. Also, call two sane and upright men as witnesses. If two men are not found, then call one man and two women whose religion and honesty you are satisfied with, so that if one of the women forgets, the other can remind her. The witness should not refuse to be a witness to a debt and must testify if required. Do not be lazy to write down the debt, no matter how small the amount, as this is more just in Allah's law, more reliable as evidence and more likely to remove any doubt in the type. Amount or period of the debt However, if the transaction is for an item that is present in exchange for a spot price there is no harm in not writing down, since there is no need to do so. Calling witnesses is legislated so that disputes do not arise. It is unlawful to cause any harm to the witnesses or the ones who write, nor may they cause any harm to those who request them to write or stand witness. If anyone causes harm, he is going against Allah's sacred law. O people of faith, be mindful of Allah by fulfilling His instructions and avoiding His prohibitions. Allah will teach you what is best for you in this world and the afterlife. Allah knows everything and nothing is hidden from Him. Al-Baqarah, 282 However, it is also true that the Quran in other situations accepts the testimony of a woman as equal to that of a man. In fact the woman's testimony can even invalidate the man's. If a man accuses his wife of unchastity, he is required by the Quran to solemnly swear five times as evidence of the wife's guilt. If the wife denies and swears similarly five times, she is not considered guilty and in either case the marriage is dissolved, Quran 24,6-11. On the other hand, women were not allowed to bear witness in early Jewish society, Swidler, op. Sit, page 115. The rabbis counted women's not being able to bear witness among the nine curses inflicted upon all women because of the fall, see the, Eve's legacy, section. Women in today's Israel are not allowed to give evidence in rabbinical courts. 
Leslie Hazelton, Israeli Women The Reality Behind the Myths, New York, Simon & Schuster, 1977, page 41. The rabbis justify why women cannot bear witness by citing Genesis 18 verses 9-16, where it is stated that Sarah, Abraham's wife had lied. The rabbis use this incident as evidence that women are unqualified to bear witness. It should be noted here that this story narrated in Genesis 18 verses 9-16 has been mentioned more than once in the Quran without any hint of any lies by Sarah, Quran 11 hours 69 minutes 74, 51 colon 24, 30. In the Christian West, both ecclesiastical and civil law debarred women from giving testimony until late last century, Gage, Op. Sit page 142. If a man accuses his wife of unchastity, her testimony will not be considered at all according to the Bible. The accused wife has to be subjected to a trial by ordeal. In this trial, the wife faces a complex and humiliating ritual which was supposed to prove her guilt or innocence, number. 5 colon 11, 31, if she is found guilty after this ordeal, she will be sentenced to death. If she is found not guilty, her husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing. Besides, if a man takes a woman as a wife and then accuses her of not being a virgin, her own testimony will not count. Her parents had to bring evidence of her virginity before the elders of the town. If the parents could not prove the innocence of their daughter, she would be stoned to death on her father's doorsteps. If the parents were able to prove her innocence, the husband would only be fined 100 shekels of silver and he could not divorce his wife as long as he lived. If a man takes a wife and, after lying with her, dislikes her and slanders her and gives her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity, then the girl's father and mother shall bring proof that she was a virgin to the town elders at the gate. The girl's father will say to the elders, I gave my daughter in marriage to this man, but he dislikes her. Now he has slandered her and said I did not find your daughter to be a virgin. But here is the proof of my daughter's virginity. Then her parents shall display the cloth before the elders of the town, and the elders shall take the man and punish him. They shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the girl's father, because this man has given an Israelite virgin a bad name. She shall continue to be his wife, he must not divorce her as long as he lives. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the girl's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house and there the men of the town shall stone her to death. She has done a disgraceful thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. Deuteronomy 22 verses 13 to 21. Part 7, Adultery. Adultery is considered a sin in all religions. The Bible decrees the death sentence for both the adulterer and the adulteress, Lev. Twenty ten, Islam also equally punishes both the adulterer and the adulteress, Quran twenty four colon two. However, the Quranic definition of adultery is very different from the biblical definition. Adultery, according to the Quran, is the involvement of a married man or a married woman in an extramarital affair. The Bible only considers the extramarital affair of a married woman as adultery, Leviticus twenty verse ten, Deuteronomy twenty two verse twenty two, Proverbs six twenty to seven twenty seven. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel, D.U.T. Twenty two twenty two. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Lev. Twenty ten. According to the biblical definition, if a married man sleeps with an unmarried woman, this is not considered a crime at all. 
The married man who has extramarital affairs with unmarried women is not an adulterer and the unmarried women involved with him are not adulteresses. The crime of adultery is committed only when a man, whether married or single, sleeps with a married woman. In this case the man is considered adulterer, even if he is not married, and the woman is considered adulteress. In short, adultery is any illicit sexual intercourse involving a married woman. The extramarital affair of a married man is not per se a crime in the Bible. Why is the dual moral standard? According to Encyclopedia Judaica, the wife was considered to be the husband's possession and adultery constituted a violation of the husband's exclusive right to her. The wife as the husband's possession had no such right to him, Jeffrey H., Togui, Adultery, Encyclopedia Judaica, Volume 2, Call 313. Also, see Judith Plasco, Standing Again at Sinai. Judaism from a Feminist Perspective, New York, Harper and Row Publishers, 1990, pages 170-177. That is, if a man had sexual intercourse with a married woman, he would be violating the property of another man and, thus, he should be punished. To the present day in Israel, if a married man indulges in an extramarital affair with an unmarried woman, his children by that woman are considered legitimate. But, if a married woman has an affair with another man, whether married or not married, her children by that man are not only illegitimate but they are considered bastards and are forbidden to marry any other Jews except converts and other bastards. This ban is handed down to the children's descendants for generations until the taint of adultery is presumably weakened. Hazelton, Op. Sit, pp. 41-4. The Quran, on the other hand, never considers any woman to be the possession of any man. The Quran eloquently describes the relationship between the spouses by saying, And among his signs is that he created for you mates from among yourselves, that you may dwell in tranquility with them and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily in that are signs for those who reflect, Quran 30-21. From also from among the great signs of Allah which prove his power and oneness, is that he created for you, O men. Wives from among your species so that you may find contentment in them due to your special compatibility, and he put love and affection between you. Indeed, in the aforementioned are clear proofs and evidences for people who contemplate, because they are the ones who benefit by using their intellect. Arm 21 this is the Quranic conception of marriage, love, mercy, and tranquility not possession and double standards. Part 8 Vows According to the Bible, a man must fulfill any vows he might make to God. He must not break his word. On the other hand, a woman's vow is not necessarily binding on her. It has to be approved by her father, if she is living in his house, or by her husband, if she is married. If a father-husband does not endorse his daughter's wife's vows, all pledges made by her become null and void. But if her father forbids her when he hears about it. None of her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. Her husband may confirm or nullify any vow she makes or any sworn pledge to deny herself, number. 30.2-15 why is it that a woman's word is not binding per se? The answer is simple, because she is owned by her father, before marriage, or by her husband after marriage. The father's control over his daughter was absolute to the extent that, should he wish, he could sell her. It is indicated in the writings of the rabbis that, the man may sell his daughter, but the woman may not sell her daughter. The man may betroth his daughter, but the woman may not betroth her daughter. Swidler, Op. Sit, page 141. The rabbinic literature also indicates that marriage represents the transfer of control from the father to the husband. Betrothal, making a woman the sacrosanct possession, the inviolable property, of the husband. Obviously, if the woman is considered to be the property of someone else. She cannot make any pledges that her owner does not approve of. 
It is of interest to note that this biblical instruction concerning women's vows has had negative repercussions on Judeo-Christian women till early in this century. A married woman in the Western world had no legal status. No act of hers was of any legal value. Her husband could repudiate any contract, bargain, or deal she had made. Women in the West, the largest heir of the Judeo-Christian legacy, were held unable to make a binding contract because they were practically owned by someone else. Western women had suffered for almost 2,000 years because of the biblical attitude towards women's position vis a vis their fathers and husbands, Matilda J. Gage, Woman, Church. And State, New York, Truth Seeker Company, 1893, page 141. In Islam, the vow of every Muslim, male or female, is binding on him her. No one has the power to repudiate the pledges of anyone else. Failure to keep a solemn oath, made by a man or a woman, has to be expiated as indicated in the Quran. He, God, will call you to account for your deliberate oaths, for expiation, feed ten indigent persons, on a scale of the average for the food of your families, or clothe them. Or give a slave his freedom. If that is beyond your means, fast for three days. That is the expiation for the oaths you have sworn. But keep your oaths, Quran 5 hours 89 minutes. Allah will not take you to account, O believers, for the oaths that you speak unintentionally. He will take you to account for those oaths that you break after making them with a firm intention in your hearts. The atonement for such oaths is one of three options, feeding ten poor people with the average food of your city, by giving each poor person half a with makron of food. Or clothing them with what society considers to be a suit of clothing, or freeing a believing slave. If the person required to make atonement does not find any of these three things, then the required atonement is fasting for three days. That is the atonement of your oaths, O believers, when you break them. Guard your oaths from being taken falsely in Allah's name and from breaking them, unless it is better to do so. If it is better to break your oath, then do so and give the atonement. Just as Allah has explained to you the atonement for oaths, He also explains to you His laws, which make clear what is lawful and what is unlawful. So that you might thank Allah for having taught you what you did not know. Almida, 89 Companions of the Prophet Muhammad, men and women, used to present their oath of allegiance to him personally. Women, as well as men, would independently come to him and pledge their oaths. O Prophet, when believing women come to you to make a covenant with you that they will not associate in worship anything with God, nor steal, nor fornicate, nor kill their own children, nor slander anyone, nor disobey you in any just matter, then make a covenant with them and pray to God for the forgiveness of their sins. Indeed God is forgiving and most merciful, Quran 60 12. O Prophet, when believing women come to pledge allegiance to you, as occurred at the time of the conquest of Mecca, that they will not associate anything as partner to Allah. But they will worship Him alone, nor steal, nor commit adultery, nor kill their children in accordance with the custom of the people of ignorance. Nor attribute to their husbands their children from adultery, nor go against you in any righteous thing such as His prohibition from wailing, shaving off hair and tearing garments. Then, accept their pledge of allegiance, and seek forgiveness for them from Allah for their sins after they pledge allegiance to you. Allah forgiving to those servants of His who repent to Him and He is merciful to them. As Saf 12 A man could not swear the oath on behalf of his daughter or his wife. Nor could a man repudiate the oath made by any of his female relatives. Part 9, Wife's Property The three religions share an unshakable belief in the importance of marriage and family life. They also agree on the leadership of the husband over the family. Nevertheless, blatant differences do exist among the three religions with respect to the limits of this leadership. The Judeo-Christian tradition, unlike Islam, virtually extends the leadership of the husband into ownership of his wife. The Jewish tradition regarding the husband's role towards his wife stems from the conception that he owns her as he owns his slave, Louis M. Epstein, The Jewish Marriage Contract, New York. Arno Press, 1973, page 149.
This conception has been the reason behind the double standard in the laws of adultery and behind the husband's ability to annul his wife's vows. This conception has also been responsible for denying the wife any control over her property or her earnings. As soon as a Jewish woman got married, she completely lost any control over her property and earnings to her husband. Jewish rabbis asserted the husband's right to his wife's property as a corollary of his possession of her. Since one has come into the possession of the woman does it not follow that he should come into the possession of her property too? And, since he has acquired the woman should he not acquire also her property? Swidler, Op. Sit, page 142. Thus, marriage caused the richest woman to become practically penniless. The Talmud describes the financial situation of a wife as follows. How can a woman have anything, whatever is hers belongs to her husband? What is his is his and what is hers is also his. Her earnings and what she may find in the streets are also his. The household articles, even the crumbs of bread on the table, are his. Should she invite a guest to her house and feed him, she would be stealing from her husband. San. 71a, Git. 62a. The fact of the matter is that the property of a Jewish female was meant to attract suitors. A Jewish family would assign their daughter a share of her father's estate to be used as a dowry in case of marriage. It was this dowry that made Jewish daughters an unwelcome burden to their fathers. The father had to raise his daughter for years and then prepare for her marriage by providing a large dowry. Thus, a girl in a Jewish family was a liability and no asset, Epstein, Opsit, pp 164-165. This liability explains why the birth of a daughter was not celebrated with joy in the old Jewish society, see the, shameful daughters, section. The dowry was the wedding gift presented to the groom under terms of tenancy. The husband would act as the practical owner of the dowry but he could not sell it. The bride would lose any control over the dowry at the moment of marriage. Moreover, she was expected to work after marriage and all her earnings had to go to her husband in return for her maintenance which was his obligation. She could regain her property only in two cases, divorce or her husband's death. Should she die first, he would inherit her property. In the case of the husband's death, the wife could regain her premarital property but she was not entitled to inherit any share in her deceased husband's own property. It has to be added that the groom also had to present a marriage gift to his bride, yet again he was the practical owner of this gift as long as they were married, Ibid, pp 112-113. See also Prezand, Op. Sit, page 15. Christianity, until recently, has followed the same Jewish tradition. Both religious and civil authorities in the Christian Roman Empire, after Constantine, required a property agreement as a condition for recognizing the marriage. Families offered their daughters increasing dowries and, as a result, men tended to marry earlier while families postponed their daughters' marriages until later than had been customary, James at Brundage, Law, Sex, and Christian Society in Medieval Europe, Chicago. University of Chicago Press, 1987, page 88. Under canon law, a wife was entitled to restitution of her dowry if the marriage was annulled unless she was guilty of adultery. In this case, she forfeited her right to the dowry which remained in her husband's hands, Ibid, page 480. Under canon and civil law a married woman in Christian Europe and America had lost her property rights until late 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, women's rights under English law were compiled and published in 1632. These rights included, that which the husband hath is his own. That which the wife hath is the husband's. R. Thompson, Women in Stuart England in America, London, Routledge and Keegan Paul, 1974, page 162. The wife not only lost her property upon marriage, she lost her personality as well. No act of her was of legal value. Her husband could repudiate any sale or gift made by her as being of no binding legal value. The person with whom she had any contract was held as a criminal for participating in a fraud. Moreover, she could not sue or be sued in her own name, nor could she sue her own husband. Mary Murray, The Law of the Father, London, Routledge, 1995, page 67. 
a married woman was practically treated as an infant in the eyes of the law. The wife simply belonged to her husband and therefore she lost her property, her legal personality, and her family name, Gage, Op. Sit, page 143. Islam, since the 7th century CE, has granted married women the independent personality which the Judeo-Christian West had deprived them until very recently. In Islam, the bride and her family are under no obligation whatsoever to present a gift to the groom. The girl in a Muslim family is no liability. A woman is so dignified by Islam that she does not need to present gifts in order to attract potential husbands. It is the groom who must present the bride with a marriage gift. This gift is considered her property and neither the groom or the bride's family have any share in or control over it. In some Muslim societies today, a marriage gift of $100,000 in diamonds is not unusual, for example, see Jeffrey Lang, Struggling to Surrender, Beltsville, Maryland. Amana Publications, 1994, page 167. The bride retains her marriage gifts even if she is later divorced. The husband is not allowed any share in his wife's property except what she offers him with her free consent, El Said Sabic, Fik al Sunna, Cairo. Daryl Fad al Ilm al Arabi, 11th edition, 1994, Vol 2, pp 218 22. The Quran has stated its position on this issue quite clearly. And give the women, on marriage, their dower as a free gift, but if they of their own good pleasure, remit any part of it to you, take it and enjoy it with right good cheer, Quran 4 4. Give women their dowries with good will. Yet if they gladly give up a part of the dowry to you, of their own free will, then there is nothing to stop you enjoying it. Anisa 4. The wife's property and earnings are under her full control and for her use alone since her, and the children's, maintenance is her husband's responsibility, Abdul Halim Abu Shaka. Tahrir al Mariae fi Asr al Risala, Kuwait, Dar al Kalam, 1990, pp 109 112. No matter how rich the wife might be, she is not obliged to act as a co provider for the family unless she herself voluntarily chooses to do so. Spouses do inherit from one another. Moreover, a married woman in Islam retains her independent legal personality in her family name, Layla Badawi, Islam, in Jean Home and John Boker, edition, Women in Religion, London, Pinter Publishers, 1994, page 102. An American judge once commented on the rights of Muslim women saying, a Muslim girl may marry ten times, but her individuality is not absorbed by that of her various husbands. She is a solar planet with a name and legal personality of her own. Amir H. Siddiqui, Studies in Islamic History, Karachi, Jamiatul Fala Publications, 3rd edition, 1967, page 138.